Good morning. I want to welcome you all here to Crossroads Live. We are all a nervous wreck, but we'll get through it. I want to start with a welcome opening prayer, reading of an old hymn. We praise you, oh we praise you, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. We sing of your wonderful love, proclaim. Hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus, you will guard your children. In his arms, you will carry us all day long. Praise you, God. We praise you, we praise you, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. For our sins, you suffered and bled and died. You, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Thank you, Jesus the crucified. We sing your praises, Jesus. You bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. We praise you, we praise you, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. The heavens loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigns forever and forever. You are our prophet and priest and king. Christ, you are coming over this world victorious. Power and glory unto you we belong. We praise you, we praise you, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Join us in some songs, please. Hosanna, praise is arising, amen. In your presence. 
we're going to follow you anywhere you go in this crazy society right now. Help us to follow you. Help us to lead others to you. We just praise you, God. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Isaiah 54 through 7. The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like the one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offer my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting, because the Sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Lord Jesus, thank you. Help us to not be put to shame. Help us to stand. Help us to take care of. Help us to reach out to our communities, God. Uh, this is a trying time. We're all worried and scared, but you are sovereign. You are in control. We have no fear. We have no worry. Help us to remember that, God. Help us to carry that out. Help us to love the way you love.
to share with you. Kids, we miss you. We want you to come back healthy and strong, so behave yourselves. We'll see you when you get back here. Next week is Easter. Six of the local churches in town here have put together an Easter service that will be broadcast on AM 1450 at 10 o'clock in the morning. We will still be going live at 10, however. If you want to listen to the radio broadcast, you can, or you can watch us, or you can do both because the service here is always taped. You can check it out on our Facebook page. While you can't invite your friends to come with you to our Easter service, you can watch them, invite them to watch online. While we can't receive the offering as usual, you may mail in any offerings or donations or stop by and drop it in the slot on the door. And thank you. Thank you for supporting the church. Thank you for supporting your community that way. And if you haven't done so already, this would be a good time to gather your bread or crackers and juice for the communion that Pastor texted us all earlier this week. We'll share at the close of the message. Again, thanks for being here and singing with us.
Thank you, uh, worship team. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate you leading us in worship this morning. This is certainly a different experience. Like thousands of other pastors, like thousands upon thousands of other pastors, this morning I preached to basically an empty room, an empty sanctuary, an empty church. And, and again, like I say, pastors all over the country, all over the world are having to do that this morning. And uh, I'm preaching to uh, a quarantined body, people that are in their homes. I'm, I'm glad that you can turn in. I'm glad that you can see this. Um, I wish that I was able to be with you physically. Uh, we're not able to do this at this time, but uh, I'm really so thankful that we have this opportunity that we can, we can broadcast this and, and, and people can still take part in worship. Um, we miss you, of course. We do it each week, but we love you and, and uh, we pray for your your well-being. I'm going to stop just a minute, and I'm going to offer a prayer uh, for the body, and I want to think this morning of uh, Myrna, who's traveling to Missoula, and she's, uh, she's going through a snow st- snowstorm up there, so uh, Myrna, we're thinking of you this morning, and we're lifting you up in prayer. Robert and Sharon, who are kind of, you know, quarantined as well, and, and Robert, we wish that you would get strong. We miss, uh, we miss your jokes. Although you, si- you send your texts to us, it's not quite the same. And uh, we certainly want to think of Jason and, and Sandy who have been, cut, they came back from their trip and you guys are kind of had to be holed up in your house and uh, so we're thinking of you as well. We love you guys. Um, let's, let's pray for our body. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness that you watch over us. Father, there are people all over this land and all over this, this globe, really, that uh, they're anxious, they're worried, they're concerned, and, and uh, the news keeps coming out, and, is, and uh, it can be confusing, and we don't have any control, and we don't know exactly what's true and what is not, but the one thing that we know is true is your love for us and your faithfulness. So we ask this morning, Father, that you would you would gird up our hearts, that you would strengthen us, that we would walk in faith, in courage, in hope, because of your word to us. Father, we know you are with us this morning because your word tells us so, and it's your promise, and we know you're true to your word. So we ask that as you are here with us, that you would fill us with your hope, and with your love, and to those who are watching, that the same is true. Where two or three are gathered, there you are in their midst. So I pray your presence upon our congregation. We thank you, Father, and we thank you for your love and your grace always. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want you to know I hurt for those of you who are walking through this and are anxious. Those of you who are concerned about what might be happening or what, uh, what is true and what is not because it's certainly, it's certainly uh, a human of us to be concerned during this time. I pray for you and I heard for you who are alone, alone in a hospital room. I think one of the, 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 the scariest and, and hardest parts of this disease is the stories we've heard that people are uh, alone in a hospital room and they can't have visitors children that can't have their parents, husbands that can't be with their wives. And that's got to be extremely difficult. So we want you to know that we hurt for you and we pray for you. And as we gather around the laptops and our phones and whatever you're using to be able to view this, I want to encourage you. The word encourage means to instill courage. It means to give strength to. And I want to do that for you. Because when it gets hard... When it gets hard, we need someone. We need someone to encourage us. We need someone to lift us, to give us strength, give us hope, to let us know things are going to be okay. I can't help but think of Winston Churchill during those hours when when Britain was on the brink of collapsing during the Second World War. And Winston Churchill stood up and he was the man of the hour and he gave strength and he gave purpose and he gave hope to the people of England. And it rallied the people in a way that uh, so many other things had not. So I want to encourage you this morning. 
And I want to remind you of his promise, of God's promise that he is always with you, always with you. So today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, allow me to remind you of what God has done and what God is doing because I think you need to be aware of that. I think we need to be reminded. It's not something that you don't know, but it's something that we need to be reminded of. I think that's part of the, the reason that we meet as a church. Certainly, we learn things as we grow. That's true. But more than anything, as we come together as a church, we're reminded of the truths of God, and therefore we're encouraged to walk with him. This week, as I took the time to read through the Gospel of John, I was taking notes, and I went back, and I went over my notes again and again. And as I did so, I picked up on some things that I want to share with you this morning because we all need to be encouraged, and I'm included in that. So one of the very first things in the Gospel of John that we're all aware of is John 3.16 and, of course, John 3.17. Where John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, that through his Son the world might be saved. John writes to tell us this. He came that you might know his heart. One of the very reasons that God came in the flesh and in his son Jesus was so that you might know his heart. So many things had been misinterpreted. If you've ever written a letter or written an email or maybe posted something on Facebook, you may have experienced a time when people misunderstood your intention. They can't read your tone of voice in a letter or in an email. And so many times we feel as though We've been misunderstood, and, and perhaps we have. Jesus came that you might know his heart behind what he had said, behind the law, behind the prophets, behind all of it, but it gets, because it seems like it had been so misunderstood. And by the time that Jesus is ministering on the earth and the way he does with his disciples, the leaders of, of Israel they had, they had drifted so far from the Father's heart and they were fell into a, real, a true legalism about the Scripture. But John reminds us, God came into the world that we might, that we might have hope and, and because our hope comes from the fact that God loves us so much that he didn't want us to die in sin but to have everlasting life. But the reality is the enemy battles this truth constantly. The enemy tells us all the time of messages of judgment, of condemnation. You may have heard those voices that, that the enemy has placed in your heart, in your mind, in your, in, in your mind's ear. You've failed one too many times. You've gone too far. You've ignored his voice one too many times. You're too broken. You're too d dirty. You're too useless and you carry too much baggage. I don't know about you. I've heard those voices in my own head from time to time. Seems like the enemy is trying to weigh me down. The enemy is trying to let me know that, that I'm faltering, that I don't have what it takes, and that God's displeased with me. And if you've ever felt that, I want you to know that's a lie. That's not what God thinks about you at all. John writes, for God so loved, who? For God so loved you. For God so loved me. You can fill your name in, in that verse. So God so loved him that he willingly, purposely gave his only son so that all the prodigals, all the prodigals, that's you and that's me. Every one of us have drifted in some way from God in our life. In some way, we have, not, we have not lived up to what God has called us to. Every one of us has lived a certain amount of brokenness. But God came. He came that we might know his heart. He came that we might understand that he is for us. And he wants the very best for us. And he's calling us 
to that. In John eleven forty five to 48, John writes this, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the chief priests and the Pharisees and gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on this way, everyone will believe in him. Well, that's a threat. If we let him go on this way, everybody's going to believe in him. What will we do then? I, gotta, I have to say that in my heart I want to say, well, why don't you listen? If everybody else is believing in him because of what he's doing, the signs that he's doing, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. The fact is John shares seven different miracles that Jesus had performed. And he performed those miracles so that you might believe in his claim, I am. I am. He performed his first miracle at Cana, according to John, where he turned the water into wine. You've heard that story. He healed a man at the, at the side of the pool of Bethesda. He healed the official's son. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children with, with, with uh, five loaves and, and two fish. He walked on the water. He healed a man who had been born blind, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. These, demonst these demonstrate his power, his authority, and his compassion. But the enemy has worked tirelessly to discredit every one of those miracles. You can read skeptics who will begin to tell you that there are reasons for these miracles. They weren't really miracles, and they come up with some kind of an explanation that as far as the wine in, in, in Cana, the, the water being turned into wine in Cana, that there was, there, well, there was, you know, there was some uh, wine that was left in the jugs from before, and there was fermentation, and they come up with this stuff. Think about Jesus walking across the water like, a, like, like a, a, a joke or a story that we hear the, today. They say, well, he knew where the rocks were. I mean, they, they worked so hard to explain the fact that Jesus had, had actually worked miracles. But the truth is, Jesus keeps working miracles, even today. Just ask Matt and Rachel, whose little boy Silas last year had a brain tumor, and they were, of course, they were concerned, and the doctors were very concerned it was a serious situation that the, the surgery could have caused more damage than the cancer. But they went in and they had the surgery and we prayed and the church prayed, this church prayed. The family prayed and we asked, Lord, please watch over that little boy. Ask Matt and Rachel, ask Grandma and Grandpa, Jason and Sandy, they'll tell you, God works miracles. Ask Deb. Ask Deb about the times that we have been places and God has stepped up. He sent angels to rescue us. She'll tell you. Ask Robert and Sharon about the times that they've made trips to the hospital where Robert was, was, had, had a serious heart attack. Ask my friend Tim who crashed on a motorcycle and about the way that, that the right people came at the right time. He was flown to the right hospital on the right the right doctor happened to be on duty. And if they wouldn't have arrived in time, if they wouldn't have had the doctor who had the knowledge, Tim would have lost his life. He would have died years ago. God still works miracles. Look at the hearts that have been transformed. I've been reading a book by Bob Goff recently. He talks about a little boy over in Uganda, a little boy, Charlie. And Charlie had been terribly mutilated. I don't want anyone to, to, to describe that this morning, but get the book Everybody Always by Bob Goff and read the story for yourself. But this little eight-year-old boy had been terribly mutilated by the witch doctor, and he was, he was bound to spend the rest of his life that way. And Bob Goff happened to be talking to a doctor one day. He had heard about, and the doctor called him and said, I want to I do what I can to help that little boy. He says, it's impossible. There's nothing that can be done. He says, I can do it. I says, what? Says, I can do it. God has given me the gift. He's given me the knowledge and given me the skill. I can heal this boy. 
Bob flew him over to Uganda and, and, and got the boy and brought him back to the States to the hospital in, in, uh, in L.A. And there the, the boy was operated on and he was restored. And that boy today is telling about his story around the world because of what has happened to him. Or Stephanie Fast, who three years old, was put on a railroad train and she was sent through South Korea to get off and nobody was there. She lived four years on her own in the bushes, just surviving. And today, she leads, uh, she leads uh, seminars and workshops for women, for, for people who have uh, experienced abuse and abandonment. And she's leading a vital ministry because of the way that God worked in her life and in her heart. Ask Lee Strobel, who was a confirmed atheist, until he began to do, putting his journalistic skills to use, searching for the truth about Jesus and became a devoted follower of Jesus. He's an author, he's a professor, and he's a solid Christian. God is still working to transform people's lives. Think about your own life. Think about the way that God has worked in your own life in order to bring about a peace and a, and a direction and a purpose and to give you a hope, a hope that you would not have aside from him. Yes, Jesus performs miracles. But the enemy would like to tell us that those are not miracles. And he came that he would help us to understand our real need. In John 19, verses 1 to 11, John writes these words. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed it in a purple robe. And they came up saying to him, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may not, so that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crowns of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, uh, said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was, he was even more afraid. He entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me has the greater sin. He who delivered me to you has the greater sin. See, Jesus came and gave his life that you might understand your need, your real need. Because we have a lot of perceived needs in our life, don't we? And walking through this, this uh, coronavirus where we're kind of, you know, kind of holed up in our homes and we're only supposed to go out so much and so, so many businesses are closed, we're finding out that a lot of our needs are wants. They're not really needs. See, once again, the enemy does not rest. He does his best to, con to convince you of your need for stuff and your need of a false security. A security that doesn't come from God but comes from the things of the world. He comes to convince you that you're not all that bad. The fact is you're pretty good. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of resonates with me. I think of my life, and I see some things that I've done wrong. Yeah, I've done some things wrong, but well, I've done a lot of things right. I grew up in the church. I stayed in the church. I, I, I sang in the choir. I taught a Sunday school class. I went to school to study to become a pastor. Not everybody studies to do that, but, but there are things that you do in your life. I think of those who were helping with worship this morning, Deb, who was singing, and Mark playing the guitar, and Allie singing and playing the piano. Those are good things. 
And the enemy would like to fill our minds with the reality that, yeah, we're doing all these good things, so you're not really that bad. It is good that we do those things. But we can't get to the point where we forget the fact that there's a real price for our sin. And we need to look at our sin for what it is. And it's hard to do. And again, the enemy would like to convince us, you're not all that bad. Let me ask you. Have you, ever, have you ever said something that wasn't altogether true? Have you ever withheld your tongue when you knew you needed to speak up? If you've done that, I'm afraid to tell you you're a liar. Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you, anything? You kept back too much change that somebody gave you by mistake. Or you found something that was, was sitting someplace after a work day and you walked home with it and you just kept it and you didn't let anybody know. Have you taken anything that didn't belong to you? I got bad news for you. You're a thief. Have you ever been jealous of something that somebody else had? Not just it would be nice to have that. Not just to say, you know, Joe's got a pretty nice uh, BMW. I wouldn't mind having one of those. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being jealous. If you've been jealous, then you've been guilty of coveting. You're a coveter. Have you ever looked at someone that you're not married to with an unhealthy kind of thought of the background? A little bit of, you know, just thinking a little bit too much. If you have, Jesus says you're an adulterer. Have you ever been broken and crushed because something that, some thing that you had was lost, was taken, was broken, was stolen? Sounds harsh, but the truth is if you have, you're an idolater. You put other things but that, are, that are more important than God in your heart and in your mind and your life. There, there, are, there are a myriad of ways that we sin. There are a myriad ways that we fall, that we fail. Let me ask you one more question. Have you ever looked at the, the story of, of Easter, the story of the crucifixion? And have you ever gotten angry at the Roman soldiers who treated Jesus the way they did? I can hardly bear to watch the movie The Passion. It hurts. I, don't want, I want to turn away. That's understandable. But have you ever gotten angry at the Roman soldiers for treating him that way? Have you ever gotten angry at the Jewish leaders, at the Sanhedrin, for constantly going after Jesus, trying to trap him, and then ultimately pulling together this mock trial that was illegal and broke every one of their, their, their laws in order to get Jesus found guilty. Have you ever gotten angry about that? I've gotten angry about that. Have you ever gotten angry at Judas for betraying Jesus? How could you do that? I hate to tell you, but if you have, then you don't understand it wasn't the Roman soldiers, and it wasn't the Sanhedrin, nor was it Judas that put Jesus on the cross. They were just a means to an end. What put Jesus on the cross was my sin and your sin. And we want to get angry, and we want to blame everybody else, but the truth is, it's me. If I didn't, if I didn't sin, then Jesus wouldn't have to die on the cross. If you didn't sin... Jesus would not have had to shed his blood on the cross because sin, yours and mine, it requires a payment. It requires restitution. It requires, it requires blood. And that blood was shed by Jesus. You may have accepted Jesus years ago or you may have accepted Jesus just a short time ago. Or it's possible that you have yet to give your heart to Jesus, but, but you're thinking about it. It's something you'd like to do because you're recognizing, even in the midst of all that's going on right now, that my, my life needs to be on track with Jesus. I need to set things straight with him. So either way, I want to give you the opportunity to settle things this morning whether you've known him all of your life or whether you've just recently come to know him, I think it's helpful for us to remind ourselves 
of the fact that especially, especially at this time of year that I have sinned, I have fallen short of God's desire for me, and I am responsible for Christ's death on the cross. And so I want to ask you this morning, as you consider the fact that he came and that he healed and he gave his life for us, I want to ask you this morning if you would pray with me, if you would pray a prayer of confession. Would you pray with me? Father, I confess my sin to you. All the sins that I know and the sins that I don't know, the sins that I don't see, I recognize, Father, that I fail you. I, f I, I confess that my life is, has its broken places. I confess my selfishness. And Father, I claim your blood. I claim the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross as payment for my sin. And I humble myself, aware of my pride, and I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to sit on the throne of my life. I ask you to be the boss of my life. I ask that you would guide me and direct me, and I pray that you would be patient with me as I continue to grow. But help me to hear your voice and help me to respond in a way that brings you honor and draws other people close to you as they see someone who is not perfect, but someone who is committed to living for you. Help me to be gracious with the people around me, recognizing that I'm just as broken as anyone else that I see. Help me to be patient with them because not everybody's at the same place, Father. But most of all, I ask you that you would help me to live for you. Help me to live for you in a way that brings you honor and glory. That when all things are done, having forgiven me, you can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you for your, for your blood on the cross, Jesus. Thank you for giving us this incredible gift. It's more than we can bear to watch. But you gave this for us. So wherever we are this, this morning, Lord, in our homes, in the church building, we ask that you would you would help us to, to live for your honor. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to take uh, communion this morning. I asked you if you would, uh, earlier this week, I asked if you would go ahead and gather a few elements so that we could share communion. It's something we normally do at, on Palm Sunday. And uh, without your being here, it's a, it's a bit different. But uh, I'm asking you whether you have... Uh, is some, some unleavened bread, uh, some, some pita bread, uh, perhaps some, some Ritz crackers. <laughs> I don't know what you have in your house, but, but would you take that and perhaps a bit of juice and let's, let's take communion together this morning. Having already prayed a prayer of confession, um, let us simply be aware that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sitting with his disciples and having loved them till the end, John tells us. That's a beautiful thought, that Jesus loved them till the end. He loves us to the end, all the way. It's just not so far until we've messed up, but Jesus loves us all the way to the end. And having loved them to the end, it says that, that he broke the bread and that he handed it to his disciples and he said, as often as you do this, remember me. My, bread, my body was broken for you on the cross. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, the cup represent, represents my blood that was spilled for you on the cross. And as often as you take it, do so in remembrance of me. This day in the, the life of our church, 
has such a deep significance. I look forward to next Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection, when we celebrate the fact that Jesus came and back to life and walked out of that tomb and gave us this amazing promise of eternal life. And it changed the lives of the, of the disciples. They devoted the rest of their lives to sharing the gospel wherever, wherever that, that they were led to. They were tortured. They were imprisoned. They were shackled. They were, they were brutalized. But they had a hope inside of them that they have passed down through the ages to us. And we still have that hope. And that's a beautiful day. But today is so significant as we think about what Jesus did for us on that cross and how harsh that was. So this week, as we go through this week, I would encourage you to reflect upon that last week in the life of Jesus as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem and he spoke with the leaders and he spoke with the disciples and he encouraged people. In the last week of his life, he encouraged people. In the last week of his life, he healed people. He loved people and he showed them compassion. The skeptics and the atheists, they, they, they scoff and they mock they don't know my, they don't know my Lord. They don't know my Jesus. They don't know the one who lifts me and encourages me. They don't know the one who has forgiven me and given me new life. They don't know. But they need to know. They need to know. Soak in this week. Allow it to move in your heart and move on your mind what God has done for us. And as you have an opportunity to minister to people in your life, would you tell them how much God loves them? It's not your job to convince them. It's your job to pray for them and to tell them and ask the Holy Spirit to work on their heart. This is such, such an important week. I pray blessings on you this week. Father God, work in our hearts, work in our lives, work in our community, work in our world. Don't know what all you're up to, Lord, with a, with a virus that, that, that seems to be exploding around the world, but I believe that you are up to something. I believe that you can take this and you can make something amazing out of it, that we will see hearts change, lives transform. Lord, I believe you'll see the, the church come to life in the way that we have not done, that we will discover something new about you. And people won't be able to shut us up. That we'll, we will tell people passionately wherever we go, he has risen just as he said. Bless you, Father. Bless you. Jesus, bless you, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.